There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. I don't read much history now. I have a history degree and I love history, but I don't read history books that much. I read literary biographies more than anything else. My guilty pleasure is biographies of the British royal family. Ah, mm -hmm. I love them too. From Queen Victoria to the present, like going that far back, even a bit farther back than that, I am just obsessed. So I Me will too. be... Oh, great. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> this Zoom chat just got hijacked. We're not going to go. So what have you read that's been good? The Quest for Queen Mary. Yes! Brilliant. I oh. loved it. What did I also read recently? Oh, my gosh. About the suicide of Rudolf of Bavaria with his young mistress. Oh, I don't uh, know that story. In the late 19th century. Oh. And then what's another one that I read recently? Here's one that I would recommend for you that kind of straddles the line uh -huh. between royalty and true crime and historical nonfiction. Actually, this is probably my favorite book of the last couple of years. It's called They All Love Jack by Bruce Robinson. It is basically his take on picking a main suspect for Jack the Ripper. But and what it really is, is a broad, incredibly in-depth history of the Masons in the 19th century and how the Masonic influence had such a profound impact on the behavior of the aristocracy and, and the royal family. Now, his suspect is nobody connected to the royal family, exactly. Oh, because that had been a theory that I think is... That been has been a theory. It's Reddit. nothing to do with that. What was his name? Um, Prince... It uh, was Prince Albert Victor. Prince Albert Victor, the Duke of Yeah, Clinton. I mean, he certainly features in the book. He is in no way the suspect. But it is so beautifully written, and it's just wow. like a searing indictment, really, of the aristocracy during wow. that period. Wow, 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 wow. There, you should give that one a, it's a big sort of tome. Great. And, and you cannot put it down. That's fabulous, thank you. Yeah, I love The Quest for Queen Mary so much and I had no idea because I hadn't read the original biography of Queen Mary by Pope Hennessy, but what a beautiful writer he was. Yeah. The prose. Yeah. And making Absolutely. those members, yeah. those lesser known members of the royal family come to life like that, it was like a novel or a short stories. Absolutely. Well, the best, you know, historians really do write like novelists. Yeah. Um, Eric Larson is another one of my favorite. Uh, His writing is just, it's, it's just absolutely beautiful. Everything he writes is wonderful. Have you read, uh, what is it called, 99 Glimpses of Princess Margaret? No, I haven't. I've seen that one, but I haven't read it. I read it and I liked it and then it hasn't aged well in my memory. I kind of now am I'm thinking I have to go back and reread it because some of the, it started out brilliantly with these little tiny nuggets, essayistic nuggets of just one little facet of her life. And mm -hmm. it's, so again, a really innovative structure for a biography. And then it seemed like he got bored with that structure. So he continued it, but it lost the power of those first few nuggets oh, I see. And, and then so it read like you were it, it kind of switched it felt like to me like it switched more over to conventional biography but he was still putting a bit in small little paragraphs on one page it didn't oh I see. that way but there was a couple things in there that i thought the more i thought about them afterwards i mean we're all works in progress and i'm definitely a feminist in progress but there were some things in there that i thought were in retrospect, we're pretty yeah. downright misogynist. Hmm. But I well, have, that could be me retranslating what I read. I have to go back and reread it. With some of these royal biographies, you know, they're written by old boys, you know, these members of the old guard who have been royal insiders for a long time, which is how they got permission to write the books in the first place. But they're really writing from a different era and a different perspective. You do get that sometimes. She was yeah. beautiful, and she was a sex symbol in her day. But the way that that was, was written about, it did, he didn't interrogate 
it at all. And there's a scene where she's visiting, I think she stayed overnight at some aristocrat's house, and there's a photo of her with their 17-year-old son and the son, I, the photo is not in the book, but it's written about in the book. The photo of the 17-year-old son with standing with Princess Margaret, and he's got a boner. <laughs> it, it's very oh. obvious in the picture. And the more I thought about that, the way he wrote about that, it's really bugging me. So again, I have to go back and... and was it a bit sleazy? It just seemed he like he, oh. he was enjoying it more than he was interrogating it. I, I don't know. Not really oh, comfortable. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, that's a shame. But there were parts of the biography that were, that were really innovative. So you might mm -hmm. want to check it out. So. Oh, one more recommendation. Please. It's, it's called 17 Carnations. And it's basically about, again, this is where my two interests overlap. It's basically about the Duke of Windsor mm -hmm. and, then, and then the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, uh, you know, as well as the Duke while he was Edward VIII yeah. and, and the Nazis. And why the title? So 17 carnations? Supposedly, Wallace Simpson used to receive uh, bouquets of carnations from Joachim von Ribbentrop, who was the... German ambassador in the 30s. Very interesting. I will check that one out too. Thank you. And I, I could actually talk about royal biographies and oh. such for another 45 minutes, but probably half of my subscribers will be asleep now. So. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. We should move on. We can revisit the topic another time. We, we can we, just... We, we shall. We can, yeah, yeah. I want to. I want okay, to. Okay, good. Well, let's and do just, it. Uh, I'm interested in... African history, and I'm starting to get into Canadian history because I am starting to wake up to what a racist country Canada is. We love to mm. compare ourselves to the United States and do a little superior dance, and that's a bunch of BS. So I'm mm. actually reading a book now that's a history of how the prairies were cleared of the indigenous population to make room oh. for the for the white people to come and start farming, which is well, the that sounds family very... story, and it's really yeah. opening my eyes to a lot, so. I mean, I'm from Colorado, and there certainly was quite a bit of that there as well. So what mm. else have you been reading? Gosh, let's see. Or um, what, coming up on your reading list in the Oh, yeah. Well, um, I've actually just bought Holiday Heart, which now, is... Now, that name is familiar, but I can't place it. That's Charlotte Coombs' new translation. Right, and I, but I can't um, place what it is. Oh, is that for Charco Press? Yes, that's from Charco. Okay, Roan um, um, talked about it, too. It's about a married couple who are um, immigrants. It's just it's the story of a marriage and the story of, of how I've been sort of slowly disintegrating Who is that's i believe that's margarita oh, Mar yeah. it's margarita Garcia robayo that's right i have a book her last book that was translated it's a collection of novellas or short stories which i haven't read yet is that fish soup that's right i have fish soup on my show and that, that's also translated by okay. oh, so great so uh, women in translation month is coming up how are you planning to celebrate First of all, I'm very excited. The founder of Women in Translation Month, Matel Redzinski, right. has launched an initiative where you can sign up to be part of a gift exchange. You can gift somebody a book by a woman in translation and they will gift you a book or somebody else will gift you a book. So it's like a chain. So I've signed up for that and I'm really excited about that. So it's like a blind, you don't know what you're getting type of thing? Yeah, you fill out a form. She set up an online form, and uh, you can find this by uh, looking at the Literature and Translation group on Facebook, I think it is. There's also the Women in Translation group on Facebook, and then there's her Twitter as well. Great. And do you know if, what the time limit on that is? It's a relatively quick turnaround, only because Women in Translation Month is coming up so soon. Right. So I'm hoping to get this video up just before August, at the end of, of July. So. I'll put all the details and people. It, yeah, people can check it out. Hopefully it'll still right. be going on. So I'm taking part in that. Quite excited about that. Also, I, and I can show you this, I am um, just about to begin a sample and a reader's report of this book, which 
It's called Le, Le Testament des Solitudes, hmm. and the author is Emily Prophet. She is a Haitian author hmm. who has written several novels. She's worked for the Ministry of Culture. She's been the director of the National Library of Haiti. She's not published in English translation at all, and so I'm hoping to change that. Yeah, so that's maybe the most important project, let's say, for Women in Translation Month. That's bad. And I actually have two. I have a book coming out relatively soon. It's not going to be released until next February, but I have just finished the oh. final edits on it. So it's close enough, let's say, for Women in Translation Month. The book is called The Beast in Paradise, and that's coming out early next year, as I said, from Europa Editions. Uh, the author is called Cécile Coulon, who is kind of a prodigy. This is her, I think this is her ninth novel, and she's only just 30. Wow. <laughs> it's remarkable. And her books are beautiful. You know, they're very universal stories. They feature a lot of very strong women. There's a darkness to them, but a lot of beauty and a lot of power. And she tends not to place her stories in an identifiable setting in terms of place or time. Mm -hmm. So they have a very timeless quality, a very universal quality. Something could be taking place in the 50s or the 80s or the 90s. You can't really tell. So that it takes you out of your automatic impulse to place a story or a setting in relation to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, it was this many years ago. People thought this way then. It's a very pure kind of style in that way that she has. Wow. I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to that. Good, thank you. I don't want it to come across as me recommending to you, but maybe if you know about these books oh, or yeah. anything, or I'll use this video to recommend them to my subscribers. This is one of my favorite works of Women in Translation. It is an Urdu novel, The One Who Did Not Ask by Altaf Fatima, uh -huh. translated from Urdu by Ruxana Ahmad. Out of print, this is a, what is it? Asian writer series from Heinemann, but it's out of print. And uh -huh. I picked it up at a used bookstore in Tokyo a, a few uh -huh. years ago, and I love this book so much. And in the middle of, of filming my review of it, I found out that because Alta Fatima was still alive, she was like 93 or 97 or something. And uh -huh. in the middle, just after I finished the book, I found out she had died. Oh, this book was published. There's no actual original publication date, but I think it was published 40, 50 years ago and then translated okay. in the 70s or 80s or something. It's a sweeping family saga from pre-partition India and then oh. in Pakistan. And the family dynamics are incredible. It's the writing oh. is beautiful. And for such an insular culture as this family lived in, mm -hmm. the central relationship is a friendship that may or may not end up turning romantic and I'm not going to spoil anything between the tomboy daughter of this family and a Chinese guy living in the city. Oh, that sounds fabulous. But, yeah, yeah, it's a really near and dear to my heart. It, you have mm -hmm. to buy it used because it's not in print anymore. But we exactly. like to buy used. We like to support our bookstores and booksellers and secondhand. That's right. That's right. So that's that's one. Yeah. This is on my favorite shelf. And also on my favorite shelf is the Norwegian novelist from the 20s and 30s, Cora Sandell. And this is her autobiographical trilogy, no novels, in autobiographical mm -hmm. novels. The first one nice. is Alberta and Jacob. I think it was about 1926. Mm -hmm. uh, Alberta and Freedom a few years later. I read those two. And this month, this year for Women in Translation Month, I am going to read the third and final of the trilogy. Oh, fantastic. Alberta Great alone. covers. Great covers on all three of those. Yes. And they are still in print. Translated, gorgeous translation by Elizabeth Roken. Roken. Uh, I just love this book so much. So she is oh. one of my favorite writers on the basis of these two books. Oh, well, thank you for that. Those sound great too. Yeah, she grows up in the north of Norway, which is apparently the wrong side of Norway. Like, that's not where the cool people are from. And uh -huh. she's a very dysfunctional family. And she eventually, in volume two, ends up trying to make a new life for herself as an artist in Paris. Oh. Just beautiful, beautiful. The writing is so beautiful. So, oh, that really does sound lovely. I recommend those to you and to anybody okay. who's watching. Brilliant. Books that get talked about enough. Do you have an idea of what the next book you're going to pick up 
will be other than anything that we've talked about already? To read or to translate? Oh, well, actually both of you, I don't, didn't know whether you'd want to talk about future translation, but please tell us if sure. you are. Well, for reading, uh, you know, my pile is so enormous. I tend to just kind of close my eyes and pick one because there are so many that I want to read equally. I don't mind if you want to close your eyes and pick something. <laughs> yeah, maybe I, maybe I should do that. Oh, actually, yes, I, do, I know what it's going to be. I think there are only two of them so far, but they are crime novels, and they are written by a woman called Katya Ivar, but she writes in English, and the main detective in the books is a woman called Hella Mauser. They're just quite good mysteries. They're set in the 50s in Finland. Oh, okay. It's very interesting because this is still not long at all after the war. So Finland is still really recovering from, you know, and obviously they share a border with Russia. So yeah, they're very good mysteries. The next thing I read is going to be the second book in that series. Great. And next translation uh, project? Next translation, I should call it my current translation okay. project. It's going to keep me busy for a little while yet, but I'm very excited about it. First of all, it's nonfiction, and I have translated couple of nonfiction books, but I've mostly translated fiction. So this is a nice change of pace for me. Great. It's being published by Pegasus Books. It'll be out sometime next year. Ooh. And it is called, the English title, I believe, is going to be The Science of J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh. So what it is, is a collection of, of essays written by a number of scientists in various disciplines. Huh. You're in applied sciences. Hmm. So you have social anthropologists, linguists, geologists, geographers, metallurgists, botanists. And they are examining Middle Earth and examining Tolkien's writings through the lens of their various respective scientific disciplines. So not only is it incredibly interesting and incredibly informative, it is a beautiful book, big, hardback volume full of stunning illustrations that is going to be really not just a reference, but it's going to be a collector's item. Awesome. I'm deep in the middle of that one right now. I'm assuming you're a big Tolkien fan? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I always feel like when I translate an author, I feel connected to them in a way, even if they're gone. Like, for example, I have translated a book by Alexander Dumas. Mm, yes, um, I saw. And so I feel like we have a connection. And I also translated, gosh, it's, I think it was 2011, a, a biography of Hergé, who wrote Tintin, who created Tintin. Oh, okay. That was put out by the Johns Hopkins University Press. It's by a man called Benoit Peters. And the book is called Hergé, Son of Tintin. Huh. And so I sort of feel like I've got a, a link to Hergé as well. Sure. And now I feel like I've got sure. a bit of a link to Tolkien. So it's kind of an honor. That's fabulous. And it's fun. That's yeah. Fabulous. Wow, you are just one of the most interesting people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for saying. It doesn't feel like it when I'm just, you know, sitting in my little cave, hunched over my keyboard, translating. The process itself is so far from glamorous, as I think any translator will tell you, but it's really exciting to be a translator right now because I feel like literature and translation is finally getting the kind of attention it deserves. I mean, there's still a way to go, but I really think we've made so much progress in the last, let's say, 10 years, leaps and bounds. And it doesn't seem to be slowing down. So I'm just so thrilled to be a part of it. And I'm happy to be a very small part of it in the fact that that's what I read and that's what I promote on my channel. Yeah, uh, and you of are. The percentage of, of what I read is translated literature and I am happy to do whatever I can for that. So It's um, so important. It makes it a big is. difference. It is. But I want your name on the cover of the next one. Mm, well, we'll see. That's an individual choice by each publisher. Okay. I know some people feel more strongly about that than others. The thing that I find the most disappointing, I would say, these days is when a book is in translation is reviewed and the translator is not mentioned mm. or the translation is barely mentioned at all. That I just think at this point yes. is really unacceptable because books do not appear in English 
by magic. It's a lot of time and a lot of effort and a, a lot of, you know, creative energy that goes into translation. It is very much a craft, um, every bit as much as writing is. I mean, we are writers. Right. It's very important to me that translators are given their due in book reviews. Well, all of that hard work and knowledge and brilliance and nose to the grindstone, all of the non-glamorous aspects that creates a magical result. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on my channel. And I hope that you'll come back. Yes, I would love to. Oh, I would love, love to. to. How about tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can have, you know, spend a, we can dedicate a whole hour to uh, books on royalty if you want. Yeah, Maybe we'll I'll... clean out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tina. Thanks. Thank you.